Hi, everybody. This is Chris Phillips, somewhat fearless founder, executive director of Democracy Cafe. Uh, this is a weekend. It's a Saturday, a Sunday. Jesus. And so, well, I get my days confused because I'm a dad and I became a dad late. But this is our latest iteration, Socrates Cafe inspired program called Cafe Aratista. And it's all about, well, Chris, Mr. Socrates Cafe, being at a cafe while he does it and interviewing people and having exchanges with people that I feel are aratistas. That's a word I coined. It's based on the Hellenic Greek term arate that for people who strive to be excellent all arounders in all dimensions of life. And so my main man is on today, uh, Odin Archford Halverson. And Odin is a writer, uh, does videos. He does a little bit of everything. What all we freelancers need to do to get by. The difference between Odin and, and me is Odin's talented. And <laughs> my, my, my only gift is perseverance, you know? I mean, like I'm working on a new book right now, Odin. I'm like, most people could do this baby in two drafts. It takes me like 30, but I'll do it. I'll do it, man. And so hey, I'm getting somewhere. The drafting is where, is where the real work is, you know? We, we can write something, but until it goes through that drafting process, it's just this raw lump of clay, so. No, no, oh, no. You. You, just, you, just, you, just, you just posted about <laughs> ripping out some 30 plus page incredible essay and, and like this. I can't do that. Uh, well, that was that was fun. That's for my uh, my third semester, uh, my MFA program, right? Stone Coast. So for that, in Maine, I, in in Maine, in Maine, well, I, I spent, began my writing life. That's right. That's right. Fifty-two dollar <laughs> a week job as a newspaper reporter, and the first guy I interviewed was Stephen King. I mean, that's pretty amazing. That's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Also, like uh, Stephen King is definitely one of those one of those powerhouse mythic figures in Maine. You know, you you mention him, and people have this like tingle in the back of their necks, and their eyes light up. They're like, "Oh yeah, King." <laughs> that's great. Yeah. So you okay? So tell me about your. Where are you in the program now? Because this is a really really cool program. Oh, it is. It is. Stone Coast is a fantastic program. Um, I am currently in my third semester. And uh, the project you were just mentioning is my critical project for graduation. Uh, I decided to do mine on geography within Tolkien's Legendarium, within Which his I overall. I started reading in fifth grade, and I've read oh. many, many times, and now I get to read it with my kids. That, see, that is good. That's good parenting. <laughs> I read it for me too, though. I love it. I get a, of it. Never if you get a chance, you should introduce your kids to um, some of the works found in this book right here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I got them all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got, got Silmarillion. Yeah. Oh, you have no idea oh. who you're talking to. <laughs> no, I, I am. I am. I'm on it, man. All right, good, yeah. <laughs> I do fade out into light and darkness, don't I? You do. As I was saying, just, just like a Lord of the Sith, it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so, you, so you're doing all this. I mean, you, you, and you also wrote this beautiful essay about planning. Like, even mm. though you had this very unexpected thing where you had to evacuate from the yes. fires, you, you're still getting it done somehow in a very intensive program, pretty intensive life. Doing my best. Yeah, the fires were intense. You know, they had evacuated everyone from the actual side of the fire all the way out to the coast. So that got a crimp in my semester plans last year a little bit. The, uh, the thing was, I, I still managed to get everything in on time. The only thing that I had to ask for an extension for of about a week was for my, um, uh, my workshop pieces for, for the workshop this year. So I think I managed to do pretty well. My mentor was very, very impressed. He said that uh, I was the first person ever in such circumstances who, you know, who he had worked with, who had managed to stay on time. And that, that's a nice, it's a nice pride moment, you know, it made me happy. Um, Incredible. So, hey, yeah. so how do you feel about where your writing's going? Very good. I mean, Stone Coast is a wonderful program. Stone Coast is, yeah, Stone Coast is exactly what I was hoping it would be working with people who are professional writers themselves. You know, they're teachers, but they're primarily writers. And that matters. 
you know, you've got people who've made this their life and who are willing to pass on some of that to you. Mm -hmm. So I'm getting not only an excellent education in terms of how my writing improves, but also in terms of how to create the life of a writer, because I, I, I want to have a, uh, uh, you know, a successful, stable life. You know, I'm not looking for international fame and glory, but I would like to be comfortable and enjoy my life. So, right. See, I want yes, international fame and glory, and I've never had an ounce of stability even with two kids. So this is where we divert. Ah, uh, fair. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, when I, so I was a writing teacher for the Creative Writing Institute at University of Maryland. Mm. And I, because I felt like, you know, a lot of really good writers are shitty teachers. Um, they don't, they don't, and a lot of not so good writers can nonetheless, like the best coaches, nonetheless get a good writer to excel. Mm -hmm. So, so I wonder about that. But the, obviously the sweet spot is to get really good writers who are also really good teachers. I mean, that's a sweet spot. But I think, I think at the core of that is essentially just a person who really loves the craft. So that's, that's, what makes, that what's, that's what makes someone a good writer and a good teacher. The craft. You know? But teaching's a craft too, I believe. And teaching is, it can be its own craft for sure. So, I mean, there are some people at, at my program or at the last program, um, you know, Goddard College, who Let me see that were very good again. teachers as well. Hmm? Let me see that cup again. This is uh, for my old literary magazine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One day, yeah. It's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that said, I think that if you are a very good teacher who has no real passion for the actual subject, then you're going to kind of fail, <laughs> even you if you have yeah. you know, good skills. Well, even in my college days at William & Mary, uh, there were wonderful scholars who were mm -hmm. very internationally known, who weren't very good teachers, and, and there were some really little known guys, and you'll never hear about them unless it's in like the acknowledgement section on my book, that uh, really made a huge difference in my life. Mm -hmm. And so it's it, it, when I, you know, I have aspirations on and off to be kind of an iconoclastic teacher. And I, at the, at the Creative Writing Institute, all my, all my students got published. Um, I don't even know if that was their goal. It was, my, it was kind of my goal. I wanted them to sort of bridge and traverse bounds and actually start thinking about that. Maybe cool. where they were. So I, it was, uh, but they rose to the occasion and it was an interesting, interesting thing. I don't think you always have to do that. And I think you can write and get, get an MFA for so many different reasons. I know one of your goals is also to be a teacher. Also. Yeah. Where does that spring yeah, from? Absolutely. Is. <laughs> well, where does that desire spring from? Um, hmm. You know, it's something I've been thinking about a lot actually lately. I think, I, I think that for me, it comes from simply enjoying the subject matter and enjoying the experience. You know, if, if I set my sights too far ahead on specific goals, then it starts to kind of lose focus, starts to lose the, the meaning, the intensity. If I'm really just focused on the fact that I love writing, if I focus on the fact that I love exploring intricate, fantastic worlds, if I love philology, if I love philosophy, if I love uh, psychology and history. That's it. That's all it is. It's just, it's just, it's love in the now. It's, it's, right. it's that experience. I like that. Love in the now. <laughs> you know, um, so, so does that sort of mesh with your philosophy of life and living? Like yeah, that. actually, in, in a lot of ways, it does. I mean, there's, once again, there's, you know, it's not an absolute, but yeah. I think for my philosophy of living, I do, I was talking about this with somebody the other day. And one of the most important things, I think, in life is to have a sense of striving. Hmm. You know, we are not creatures of stagnation. I don't think that's, hmm. I don't think that's naturally where our passion lies. I think we can tend towards it pretty easily where we fall into that little muddy pool and we can't find our way out and that's where we're at. Right. But I think that where we're happiest is actually when we're striving for something, something better and greater. Not, that's the thing though, it's not for the purpose of reaching an end goal because there is no end goal, right? right? There's no end goal here. It's just about the striving. That's actually one of the things that I love most about the Socrates uh, cafes too. 
Like, it's not we're trying to come to some goal where we have to convince the other people. It's we're striving to form a dialogue, to enrich each other. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm a big fan of process, so obviously there's destinations that can serve as springboards for, for mm -hmm. other ones. Um, my concern, and you know, is with our, with our Democracy Cafe, Socrates Cafe in these times, is the kind of deep polarization that can inhibit not only striving for others, but for oneself when we mm -hmm. create these sort of roadblocks with one another. Because the whole goal of Democracy Cafe is actually to create conditions where we want to make sure, whether they take it up or not, we, is to make sure everyone has that opportunity to strive. Because there's mm -hmm. gazillions of people who don't live in circumstances where they can. And so yeah. I, I get concerned when there's this automatic sense and sensibility where I'm right and you're wrong, my way of creating equity is right and yours is wrong, and so we're not even going to bother to have anything to do with one another. Right, that's that's a problem. I mean, I think I think right now we're facing situations in the world where, you know, it, people get confused about what about what that means, about what that that dialogue can look like when there are things like global warming that. This is not this is not an issue for debate. This is not an issue where we can backtrack or ha take half measures. This is something that needs to be met full on, head on, and completely with absolutely no deliberation. It needs to be done, and it needs well, to be done. Deliberation should be years on ago. concrete solutions. You know, my only and, and, yeah. And, and Odin, here's my thing about healthcare too. All right, so this this Kettering Foundation, which has billions of gazillions of dollars you know they just posted something on linkedin it's a good friend good acquaintance of mine so they're doing this deliberation i looked at the questions there are only three it only had, solutions only admit to three ways and i'm asking why didn't you you couldn't possibly have engaged with so-called ordinary people because they would have come up with so many more extraordinary alternatives than yeah. these three that these well-paid, well-heeled people come up with. So I worry about process because it, they, they're already cutting off the possibilities because they don't think enough of ordinary people to get their input in the framing of the questions. And that's another big difference with us. It actually gives me this idea of let's start holding these summits on Zoom with people and take on specific issues and let them help frame and formulate the questions. Because as admirable as this deliberation stuff is, it, it's so unimaginative in, in terms of the artful mm. forming of questions. It drives me bonkers. Right, well, it also, well doesn't, people. it also doesn't allow for, you know, like you were just saying, the ordinary person to be involved. Now, you can't have a democracy if the ordinary person is not involved. It, it isn't a democracy. You know, if, if the only time we're involved as the ordinary citizens of of a country or of the world is when we go to the polling booth to check the little box that we've been told to check by someone. Right. That's not democracy. That has nothing to do with the democratic condition. We need to have a, a vital and renewed sense of social identity. And that I think comes from talking to each other and communicating freely, openly, constantly but also giving them the opportunity to have input in the formulation of questions themselves, at least on many, many occasions. Because I'm worried that we're cutting off so many possibilities for creative solutions to healthcare, to global warming, simply because there's this no, no betterism among the well-paid, well-heeled, well-funded folks. And so there's this no bless oblige approach from the very beginning that, that cuts off so many other possibilities for coming up with genuine solutions to these things. Oh, for sure. You know, uh, it, I, I, one, one of my one of my interest points is is within the world of uh, computer software. You know, I'm just a I'm just a novice in there, but I find the concept of open source software to be one of the most fascinating innovations. Uh, you know, of, of modern times, where you have this idea of taking something and you display its innards to the world. And through that process, other people comment, find the bugs, work on it, make it better. And actually, by having something be open, you end up with a more secure and more functional product. I don't see any reason why, you know, that can't be the process and shouldn't be the process within our society as well. Well, you know what? 
our, our riffing here actually has given me another idea for what we should do starting this year in terms of taking on concrete issues with, uh, with our Democracy Cafe. Um, so, Odin, I'm going to be reeling you in. <laughs> Sounds good. I'm here for it. In fact, I, I'd, I'd love to make that quick note about oh, yes. uh, the new uh, Socrates Cafe yeah, medium. I going to make that note. All right. <laughs> yeah. So as if you're not doing enough in your life and for us, you've, you've taken over the reins of resuscitating our, the labor of love of me and Ceci that we started well, well over a decade ago of the Socrates Cafe magazine. And it just makes, I was so excited when I got your message because it wasn't even on my radar screen. Even though I have physical copies of our old issues of Socrates Cafe magazine, but what better place to do it on Medium and what better person to do it than you? I was, I was just thrilled to no end that, that you even wanted to do it, much less that you, you know, it's so cool. And so how, do we, how are we going to get people to, to come there? How are we going to get the kinds of folks that are philosophically minded, take part in the Socrates Cafe, um, to actually expend that bit of well, we already have a couple of people who have, uh, who have articles on there, um, and we're soliciting articles from people who we feel are, you know, useful uh, members to contribute for, for, the, for the publication. But we're also putting out open calls for submissions. Our submissions are now completely open. Okay. So all you have to do is find Socrates Cafe on Medium and apply. We're taking everything right now. We're really interested in expanding our, uh, expanding our publication well, as quickly as possible. I like your guidelines. Um, I mean, th the whole idea for me, I don't know if you ever saw the, the movie, the Pixar movie, Ratatouille. Yeah. That, um, you know, Chef <laughs> Gusto says everybody can cook. Well, I'm not sure, but I, th I do think everybody can philosophize even if they don't. But I, I do think that those at least who participate in Socrates Cafe can more than rise to the occasion and submit some really cool stuff. One of my great success stories, though, and I don't think I ever told you this, was a retired postal worker who, who came to the Socrates Cafe when I first inaugurated it. Never read a word of philosophy in his life. He became a big fan of the pragmatist philosophers, William James, John Dewey, and then he went on, was starting to study for his degree. And That's amazing. But That's he amazing. Submitting yes. some really cool pieces. You know, I mean, there's all we can always, you know, piss on different things to different people say and write. But the mere fact that they, their, the heartfelt attempt was made to do yeah. something special, um, yeah. to me, is what it's all about. To really make that heartfelt attempt, maybe, maybe the thought or essay springs from the Socrates Cafe they've taken part in. And then to, to really be a part of that uh, is a really big and fond hope for me going down the road. And I'm, I'm just so grateful to you for even, even wanting to take this on with all else that you've got going on. Oh, it's, it's, it's fine. It's, it's, uh, it's a blast. And it's right up my alley, too. So, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a perfect, it's just yeah. perfectly aligned, perfect conjunction. Looks like my, uh, my battery on my computer is uh, about... Day. 2% from okay. dying. Okay. Well, I was going to say, you sort of remind me, uh, you know, one of my favorite writers was a guy named Ernest Gaines, who wrote this beautiful book called A Lesson Before Dying. He was also a longtime teacher in Louisiana. You should check out his book, Ranger yeah. Books, but that's one of them. He just passed away. Um, beautiful man, but I always sort of aspired to be a bit like him. And I, and I truly think you're going to be a writer, writer, teacher in that mold, just on what I, and that's a really high honor I'm paying for you, by the way. And it's very sincere. Thank you. Um, Thank you. But Odin, where can people find out more about your work and what you're what you're up to? Oh, sure. Uh, so it's just Odin Halverson, H A L V O R S O N. Odin is O D I N. Odinhalverson dot com. Uh, look up uh, my work there. You'll find links to uh, things like the Socrates Cafe Medium publication, my own Medium writings, and my other published work. Okay. How about Twitter? Absolutely. I'm fully available on Twitter. On there, I am at indubitably Odin. And you are indubitably, uniquely, the, one of the coolest guys I have. And again, you came across my book at a used bookstore. Hardly anybody even does that these days. So but ha serendipity, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Odin, I, feel, I feel great love and admiration for you. I'm so grateful you're part of my life. Thank you, Chris. You too. All right. Talk to you soon. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.